I'm Evan Feigenbaum, the Vice President for Asia at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And this is one chapter in a multi-part video book on six crises and how the United States and China, despite their very considerable and deep strategic rivalry, nonetheless managed to coordinate. Mike Levitt was the former two-term governor of Utah, serving as Secretary of Health and Human Services in the second term of the George W. Bush administration, when he found himself having to deal with a rolling series of problems involving the safety of products exported to the United States from China. These products included milk and milk derivative products that were tainted with a toxic chemical, melamine, as well as shrimp, heparin, which is a blood thinning product, and even products like dog food. These safety issues became very politically toxic and close to the ground of people's lives in both countries, in China because they affected the livelihood of exporters, and in the United States because they sickened and even killed some Americans and therefore affected the welfare and safety of individuals. Levitt negotiated an unprecedented series of agreements between the United States and China including the opening of Food and Drug Administration offices in Chinese cities and the pre-positioning of American inspectors in Chinese transportation hubs, who were able to begin inspecting Chinese products to American standards. We talked to him about how he achieved those things, what was easy, what was hard, what the negotiating dynamics were like, and above all, whether there are any lessons from that experience that might be applied today in the context of the coronavirus pandemic caused by COVID-19. Here's what he told us. So this uh, story doesn't really start in 2008. It really starts in early 2007. And there had been a rash of um, product adulteration problems that were within food and drug and also in other categories. Uh, and, and not all in the United States, but highly alarming to the United States. Uh, for example, um, th there was a toothpaste issue uh, that had occurred uh, in, in, I think, Central America. There was a, also a cough syrup uh, problem that people died from in Panama. Uh, there was a, a bunch of metal paint that had high lead content that were, uh, ended up on Mattel toys that had been uh, developed in China. Uh, there had been five alerts uh, for different agri uh, 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 aqua culture products, uh, particularly fish, and there were some issues related to shrimp in particular that where we had actually needed to stop the, the, the products at the border. All of this predated any discussion of melamine other than the fact that in early 2007, the initial one was a melamine in dog food. And this one was actually fascinating uh, because the Chinese um, had, had been shipping a lot of dog food to the United States. Dogs inside the United States, including dogs of some prominent Americans, died uh, as a result of this dog food. And, uh, you know, you'd think that a human health issue would uh, set all the alarms off at, at FDA, but uh, the FDA also has responsibility for pet food. And uh, we had, uh, wait for it, 17,000 calls uh, about pet food and the Chinese. And that just set all the alarms off and it became a big news story. Uh, in, in the middle of all of this, uh, we were having regular conversations with the Chinese, most of which had revolved around the strategic economic dialogue, which um, were regular six, every six month meetings we had alternating from Washington to DC. And we had actually begun to develop pretty solid personal relationships with the Chinese, which plays out in an important way here. When we first started, it was, uh, you know, Hank Paulson, he knew them all well. He'd been there uh, 70 times. He was, uh, he was on first name status with all of them. And that really opened the door, I think, for a, a, an honest dialogue. But in the first couple of interchanges we had, uh, it was all PowerPoint presentations, not a lot of interaction. But over time, that began to uh, develop into a, 
a, a, a more personal relationship. We would dine together, we would talk together, we got to know each other, we were seeing each other over and over again. And that's important because um, at the point in time when this really began to, to, um, to come to a head in the United States, where we had this series of cascading projects or problems, um, it, it just happened that the, the strategic economic dialogue was in the United States, and, and one of them hit while they were here. And uh, um, I invited my counterparts uh, in the strategic economic dialogue, which would have been the, the Minister of Health and the Minister uh, of um, their Agricultural Inspection uh, entity, to come uh, to my office after so we could have a candid and kind of off um, scene conversation. And we had a very candid discussion, uh, which really began to be um, pivotal in all of that will unfold. Uh, their initial reaction was, look, this isn't a problem. Uh, if you guys could just get control of your news media and your Congress, this is not a big issue. Uh, we'll work through this. And, um, at, you know, at which point I explained as best I could, look, I don't think you understand the nature of the system we're in. And I don't think that it has uh, 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 really come to your full attention why this is a big problem. It's not just the products. What's on, what's on trial here in the United States among consumers is the Made in China brand. And this is a big problem for China, and it's a big problem for us, and it's being personalized in a very direct way with lots of media. And there are signs that people are beginning to see things that are made in China as being intuitive in, 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 or natively bad. And that's a problem for both of us. Well, it was kind of a tense conversation among friends. Uh, that night we had a dinner. Uh, which was uh, to honor uh, Madame Wu Wei uh, at the uh, National Architecture Museum. It's a big event, hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh, I was sitting um, between uh, the agriculture minister and the, uh, the health minister, Minister Gao, with an interpreter behind me. And we're about halfway through the dinner. And he leans over to me and literally in a whisper says, um, we've been talking and we know you're right. There is a problem here. We think we could work with you. We want to solve the problem. Uh, what can we do? And I said, um, tomorrow uh, I will appoint a negotiator and it will be my chief of staff who's my, my closest personal um, representative and um, we'll, we'll, we'll bring a team come to China and let's begin some conversations about how we can begin to create a construct that will allow China to improve the way in which you're meeting our standards and will allow us uh, to be confident that we're getting products that will meet those standards. So they agreed to that. And uh, literally within about 10 days, uh, I had a, a small team, uh, including headed by my chief of staff in China. And the, the issue that was um, uh, uh, confronting us was related to some food that it was shrimp, as I recall, that had been actually um, stopped at the border. And there were millions of dollars at stake from, for little Chinese communities that were raising this shrimp and it would it'd become a flashpoint for them. And um, so I was getting reports hour to hour, day to day, and uh, on the second or third day, uh, it had been reported to me that this, this is not going very well. Uh, they, they came in with guns blazes and blazing and, and uh, um, Anyway, uh, as we got uh, in, into the process, um, it became very evident that 
the fellow who was conducting on the Chinese side, the negotiation was under intense pressure uh, to deliver something. And uh, so my chief of staff called and said, and I think there's an opportunity here. If we can just find a way to allow them a bit of room here, um, I think we can make some significant progress. So I suggested that he tell them that uh, uh, that our purpose was to help them to learn how to meet our standards and that we would bring a team from the United States and we would help them with a shipment or two to where they knew what we were looking for. And that if they could meet it with those individual standards, then we would continue to increase the, the pace of that. Well, in, in the course of that conversation, uh, it was, uh, we didn't give up a thing, but we did, I think, demonstrate two things. One was that we would work with them. Second of all, that we had a common objective, which was not to block their food, but to have a supply of food that met our objectives and that we would help them solve this, this problem. Now, from that point forward, uh, we started into a, a lengthy process. And about that time, the president, <coughs> uh, President Bush became concerned with this cascading number of issues that were, it, was, it wasn't just food, it wasn't just medicine, it was toys, it was a lot of other things. And so he signed an executive order. He called, they called, the White House called me and said, we just feel like we need to do something about this. We can't just allow these things to continue to happen without having some, some, some action uh, taken. And so the president um, uh, created an executive order, which essentially created a, a working group on import safety, not just food, not just medicine, but all import safety, and he appointed me uh, to head that. Simultaneous to that, then I, I carved out a, 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 basically a dual role for myself. One was to head food and drug, and the other was to take the, the, the overall uh, trade relationship on import safety uh, and make that the small, the, the, the food and the drug part, part of the larger issue. That, that turned out to be a, a quite important uh, in the context of um, the way we ultimately conducted this because uh, one of the things that we learned was um, there were a lot of people who wanted to be part of that conversation. Uh, there were people, and, and everybody saw it differently. Uh, if you were at a, 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 a trade representative's office, you saw this as a trade issue. If you were at commerce, uh, you saw it as a commerce issue. If you were at treasury, you saw it as a tax issue. If you were at state, you saw it as a diplomacy issue. Uh, and, and so ultimately, being able to get the entire USG together on a series of positions turned out to be vitally important. And so I would say the collaboration that we ultimately did on, on the U United States government side to be able uh, to get to begin to bring a sense of common principles before we went to the table ultimately turned out to be really important. I, I had some relationships. I mean, I'd done the trade missions and I had become, and actually one of the things that uh, I think did play out here is that um, on one of my trade missions while I was governor, I discovered that the health and science minister uh, had a daughter who lived in, um, in Salt Lake City and was teaching a geography at the University of Utah. And um, I, when I returned home, I invited uh, his daughter and her husband uh, to come to our home for Thanksgiving dinner. And we formed a friendship uh, with her, his children. And so the next time I went to China, he insisted that I come to dinner at his house, which I guess is really unusual. So I went to the, the, the um, home of 
I went to the compound where all the ministers live and had an evening with them and had a meal at their table and we talked and then we began to correspond and we had, I say correspond, we, whenever I was there, I would see him and uh, whenever they come to see, they had a grandbaby born, a, form, a, a relationship began to develop. And so uh, while my relationships were, and then I, during the Olympics, um, uh, the, the, the mayor of um, Beijing, who became the finance minister um, during the st strategic economic dialogue uh, period, he, he was the mayor and I was the governor of the two Olympic cities and we sort of bonded over that and uh, he, he remembered that when I, so there were relationships, but they were personal relationships as much as they were anything else. And, I, I suspect that uh, the book on me uh, with the, with in China was 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 fairly uh, positive in terms of my association with the Chinese, but it wasn't you know I didn't have a Hank Polson uh, like relationship where I'd spent years and years developing them. Um, there were high level tensions uh, on uh, economic matters related to currency, related to trade. There were a lot of issues related to security. The Chinese were building their their uh, their their uh, military, big investments in in uh, that we had we'd been through this business with SARS, and there was a lot of worry that perhaps uh, they hadn't been hadn't been candid. Uh, all of that existed, and so there was a kind of built-in tension to the relationship, and I think that's one of the things that Hank. Polson uh, sensed when he thought we need to build relationships that are that are deeper than just the nation to nation relationship, and that, to my in my mind, was the real value of the strategic economic dialogue was that we had relationships with people, we had relationships with our counterparts, uh, and that then if you if you look back at what actually occurred at the strategic economic dialogue, I think Hank would say to you, the agreements that we ultimately end up striking, some a very significant portion of them came out of this import safety category. It uh, came out of the health category, came out of the, the, uh, the, 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 the food category, came out of the drug category, because we were able to work underneath all of that in very functional human areas and, uh, and, and to a large extent on the basis of some personal relationships that weren't going to get in the way of those larger clashes. And uh, you know, I think that points to the, a couple of things. One is personal relationships matter. And second of all, that, that health is a great category of, of diplomacy where you can, you know, at the same time, I started some initiatives on traditional Chinese medicine, for example. When I would go to China, I would always go out and seek to find out what they were doing in traditional Chinese medicine and what was bleeding over into Western medicine. Uh, I realized very early that they were interested in rural health care. And so rather than just go to Beijing and to, and, and, and to uh, Shanghai, and Chengdu, I would go out into Western China and I would go to clinics and I would go into the rural areas and I would do everything I could to understand what and they, they, they really valued that. And when they would come, I would take them to Alaska where they could see uh, rural medicine and things that could be uh, applicable. So we were, we were able to deal candidly in a much different and in a much different way than I think that if you're Secretary of State or Secretary of Treasury or, 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 or President, uh, just because we're, but we're kind of below the headlines. We weren't without, it, we, were, we were, you know, those things impacted it, but we were able to actually strike deals, get things done, form agreements, and move forward. Now, I mentioned all of that stuff that's going on in 2007, uh, because that does uh, offer as a, that, that should, that's a pretext to 2008 when we started to once again have issues related to melamine, this time mel melamine and milk. We also had one 
um, with uh, heparin, which is a, 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 a drug that, that uh, is used for uh, um, diabetics. And, um, but those happened after we had these agreements in place. And so what we'd done in 2007, then got tested in 2008, under the agreements, really trying to help the Chinese solve some, some problems. Uh, and, um, and by that time, the relationship was good enough. The health minister had changed. Um, it, was not, it was no longer um, um, Minister Gao. It was now Minister Chin, who was not actually a member of the party, which was just made him distinct. Um, but he, and he was a physician, whereas um, Minister Gao was not. Uh, Minister Gao was brought in, actually, he was Minister of Finance before, and he'd been brought in to clean up SARS. And so, uh, but when, when the mel melamine and, the, and milk uh, ep episode began to develop, we had a strong enough relationship that he called me and told me what, it, what was happening. And he, and he went through step by step and basically said, you know, this is a big deal. It's a big problem. It's a big health problem. We don't know exactly how to how to deal with it and uh, and he invited us to uh, to to begin to contribute solutions to it but again i think it was as a result of we had agreements in place we had a long-standing set of personal relationships and by the way that's ultimately then what drove i think one of the most consequential parts of it which was can we put fda offices uh, in china uh, we started that discussion in late 2007, it wasn't completed until 2008, but it was done through the course of the time with, um, with the melamine and, and milk and dairy products and also the, the heparin uh, issue. The Chinese are really skilled negotiators. There's no question about that. Um, but one of the things that uh, I think we successfully achieved was to take it away from taking take it take it out of being a problem that was theirs where we were being accusatory of problems they were creating to a, a shared problem uh, you you want to send us milk products you want to send us fish you want to, and 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 we want them but we can't take them until we can get to the right degree of comfort and standard uh, you would like to um, be able to inspect your own goods and have us accept that. That would be convenient for us, but only when we have confidence that you're inspecting them to a standard that meets our standard. So uh, both of us would be advantaged by that. Let's see if we could work toward some kind of common objective um, and uh, you know, I, I think that in most of the successes we had, it started with us being able to make it a common problem, not a problem that um, that they had alone. And 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 I think this gets back to the you know the just the traditional importance of face. Uh, and you know, one of the things I believe we I mean, we had serious leverage because they wanted into our they wanted our they wanted to get products in, and, and I, I, I took some care uh, to let that hang and not to flaunt it. And I think that that was very uh, uh, useful and constructive. They knew it was there. They, 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 we had an objective to be able to remove some of those things. Um, um, you know, the, then ultimately we, had something we wanted, which was FDA offices in China. That was ultimately where I need. I knew that was the our primary objective, and uh, and you know, really interesting moment in, in that. I, it became clear to me that um, the uh, in the final analysis, uh, they 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 thought it showed weakness for them to have U.S. Uh, U.S. inspectors looking at their their goods. And so I, I did a fair amount of research to make sure I was right about this, but it became clear to me that the Chinese, if they really wanted to have inspectors 
in the United States, there wasn't a lot of barrier to that. And so I, I went to them and said, look, I understand how you are feeling about this, that you, my sense is that you, that, that you feel like we're kind of unilaterally saying, we've got to come in and inspect your goods as opposed to trusting you. Uh, we do have a need for on two counts. One is if we're going to get to the point that you can inspect your own, we need to build capacity. Uh, we need to, and we need to teach you how we do it. We need to feel confident. We need to build a relationship that is sufficiently good that you, you can uh, do that. But I, I, I'll tell you what I'd be willing to, to say, and that is uh, if you'll allow us to put our offices, if you ever decide that you want to have inspectors and uh, Chinese inspectors in the Ch in, in China uh, or in the United States, uh, we'll we'll make this mutual. That was all it took. I knew they would never do it. I knew they could do it now if they wanted, but that was the key to it: was to begin to put a um, um, mutuality involved. I was surprised at how long they held out on the FDA issue. We. we I mean, I had to really push at the end to get it done in time that I could open them before I left. Uh, and we didn't, we, I think we finished the last one in December of 08. So that took longer than I, I thought it would, but um, we got it done. Part of this uh, came to understanding the situation in China. So as we got into this, we realized that you have two different entities. You, you had um, China FDA and you had what was what they know as AQSIQ, which is their inspection operation. AQSIQ is highly resourced, very um, well equipped to do inspections. China FDA, not so much. And in fact, China FDA was actually not even in the health ministry. It was somewhere else I can't even remember. As we got into their statute, we learned that chemicals that go into drugs, if they're used in China, are regulated. If they're exported, they're not regulated. So not only are we getting Chinese drugs, we're getting drugs that are not even regulated by the Chinese. And so one of the things we ultimately said to them is, if you're going to actually begin to position yourself, I mean, this was all, if you ask, how did we get that done? I think a lot of it was the idea that we're going to move toward a day when you can demonstrate the capacity and the trust relationship would be sufficiently high that you could inspect the goods according to US standard. We would then inspect your inspectors, but it would be your inspection. But we've got to build, we got to go a long ways between now and then. And, and if we don't have people there who are getting to know your people and who are teaching you and helping build capacity in your own system, um, we'll never get there. And so we, we built that having inspectors on site, not just for our own purposes, but it was to help them build capacity toward their own. Now there's another part of this, and that is we knew that they were beginning to get a lot of pressure from their own people because no one trusted, after melamine, nobody trusted them. And you know, they, they, they had one product problem after another, and then they had, you know, 50 or 60 or 80,000 children who had their kidneys damaged because of an, what turned out to be more of an economic fraud than anything else. Um, they knew they had to improve, and they th I think they thought they could learn from us. So we were giving them capacity building, but it was all based, based on our ability to kind of move uh, them toward what they that their long-term aspiration which frankly I, I, from talking to people who are, have been there the last 10 years they've made quite a bit of progress i mean the, they their system is getting better in large measure because of what we've been teaching them kind of all the usual suspects uh, who have 
FDA interests and so forth and, and, and food interests. This ultimately resulted in a, a, a series of regulations that we built. I mentioned this import um, safety task force that I, that I headed. We had 14 departments of the government. We created a series of, of um, regulations that uh, we put into a place before we left. The Obama administration reviewed them, conformed them to a statute, and passed them into what's now known as the Food Safety Act. So um, there was a lot of interest in this, and um, but it was from the usual suspects, and we were, you know, there's not the dog food thing, the 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 the, the melamine and 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 baby formula that was enough. You know, all of these things were building a big constituency and a lot of interest in it. One thing I will say, you know, we I mentioned that in 2008 we had the agreements in place and then we went through two very real uh, uh, real fire drills uh, with uh, as to see whether they would work. And um, they worked, but not perfectly. Uh, I, we, when we were, the heparin, when we were still, we, you know, we were trying to gain access to see the facilities that were making the drugs that had been adulterated, we had a very hard time ultimately getting in still, but um, it, it ultimately we did, but it wasn't automatic, um, which is a lesson. Uh, and it is that agreements are only agreements. You, you know, you still have to be able to affect them and you still need leverage to affect them even after you've struck them. Um, but, you know, lessons, high level. Um, one, I guess, would be, um, you know, I think relationships matter on a personal basis. Uh, relationships and, and, and some mileage and trust, uh, you know, the, uh, the old friend thing um, is, I think, real uh, in, in China. It takes time. Um, I think the sec a second one would be that... Um, I was always more successful when I could cast a problem as in a, this is a mutual problem we have to solve. Let's find a way that it solves it for both of us. Um, I think and a third was that it was, it, it was very helpful for me to understand their system um, better because I realized many times we were trying to negotiate a solution that would somehow dovetail, but you'd end up with two very different systems. And unless they understood our system, it was impossible to get there. And unless we understood their system, it was impossible to get there. And a good example of that was this issue of discovering the nature of where they were organized or how they were organized needed to change. It needed to be moved from where it was over to, uh, to um, the Department of, or the Ministry of Health, the way the statute was written needed to be changed to where they were regulating domestically. And, and then those are just examples. If we hadn't discovered that, we could have made lots of changes and never had a better, a better outcome. Um, I think another general lesson is that uh, you can negotiate on health um, related matters in a way that uh, can be independent of lots of the other. And in many ways, it's a relationship maintainer as opposed to simply, uh, I mean, there, there's, there's value to the overall relationship. Um, I, think, uh, I think we learned you have to have leverage. Uh, if you go in without leverage, you're not gonna get anything done. Uh, I think I learned that it was uh, better not to stick it in their face uh, but to just let it hang there as opposed to swing it. Um, you know, there, there were times when we had, we, or when we did swing it, but it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily a, as a result of a threat. Um, now, you know, I, I'm sure that there are times when you have to deal with different personalities in China in different ways, but that's the situation, the way I, I was seeing it. Uh, I think um, ha having, very well-defined objectives going in 
and recognizing you're going to go through some bluster on occasion, that it's just going to be, um, there's a certain amount of ritual that they need to go through. I remember what I was, I wasn't, I was still actually, I think I was governor. And um, I had led, a, I was chairman of the National Governors Association and I had built these relationships with China and I had each year you could agree or the chairman of the association could choose which embassy you were going to have a reception and dinner at. And because I was building these relationships with China, I chose China. And they put on a very nice reception for all the nation's governors. And something had happened in the overall relationship. And uh, they, they, uh, the, the ambassador, uh, just before the reception was going to start, uh, stood up, a bunch of TV cameras came in, and the guy just went off on the United States in a just vicious, unbelievable way. I mean, I'm just sitting here with an interpreter giving me this thing, and I think I got to walk up on the on the podium next. And the guy has just completely eviscerated the United States of America. What should I be saying? And then I turned around and I saw the news media. And I thought, okay. This guy's got a constituency. He's not talking to the, to the New York media. He's talking to the Beijing and the Shanghai media, and he's got to deliver his message. And so I chose to then stand up and say, you know, we have differences, but we're still friends. And, and uh, let's talk tonight. Tonight's a night to celebrate the things that we agree on. And, and the night went, went on. And I, I learned that from that and many other moments that, you just have to let it bluster and realize they've got their constituencies and they've got their things they've got to play on. But if you can just keep yourself focused on what the objectives are, you can ultimately get there. I can tell you with fair confidence that there were people in the Ministry of Health talking to the people at HHS. There were people in their CDC talking to people in our CDC. There were academics in America talking to the academics in China. And, I, I, and all of this stuff that's going on up here is, is just, you know, they, and, and I think it's clear that they, they uh, and that it was, that they, but for diplomatic reasons, it might have been more difficult to get uh, than, it, than it needed to be. Um, I mean, I mentioned when they, this melamine thing called, I mean, it, it, uh, I, I guess that what I'm saying is that um, I, I think it's really too bad that we have a relationship like we do, but I, I suspect there are reasons for it. I mean, these, the, these trade issues are hard issues and you've got to be, you've got to be hard nosed and confronted and confrontive on it. Um, you know, I, I don't, you can tell me, is it working? I don't know. Um, I think it, the, I didn't have to do that. And I, I don't know if I, if, if I had, if I had been more successful, I got everything I wanted. So it's, it may, may be that I, I, I was just lucky enough to be negotiating in an area where that wasn't required. I, I do think that um, there's a certain amount of sort of nationalistic public um, messaging that you can expect from China in a situation like this. And there's little question in my mind that they were um, probably not totally transparent on what they were doing. They paid a huge price in the world with SARS. And I observed a change in their behavior, not to perfection, but at least a shift to the fact that they needed to open up to the world a bit because it was not just in their interest in terms of overall foreign policy, it was in their interest on issues like this uh, to be part of a much bigger community than, uh, they, they, in the long run, they can't solve this on their own. Um, I'm not in a position to know whether they were, how transparent they were. Uh, one of the things that 
Um, I, I agreed to support Margaret Chen, who was the head of the World Health Organization and, the, and a Chinese woman. She was from Hong Kong, but she, was, she headed their, their uh, SARS uh, initiative. I spent a lot of time talking with her about the lessons that the Chinese uh, needed to learn and one, some, some that they did. Uh, and, and it was, you know, they, I think they paid a big price, both internally from their reluctance to acknowledge the problem they had and externally in terms of the way they got the blame for a 